So we are now in module two. We are going to talk about stress today. And when we begin to talk about stress, we want to first give you a definition about what stress is. First of all, this is a definition brought in from the American Institute of Stress. So they're an authority on this topic. And they say that stress is a condition or feeling experienced when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize. Now, what does that definition mean? Well, you think about this from a college student perspective and you would maybe think about a situation where you had to study for a test. You also had some homework to do. Well, the homework was kind of more the pressing issue because that's something you're going to turn in. So you focus your attention on the homework and then you have a friend or an acquaintance call you up and say, listen, let's go out. Let's have a drink. Let's have dinner. Let's do whatever. And so you go and you entertain the friend for a little bit. And before you know it, you spent too much time entertaining the friend. You then only get four hours of sleep. Now you are walking down the hall to a test that you know you're not prepared for. And so that's exactly what you've done here is you've set yourself into a position where your perception was that basically, you know, I could get by, but now I don't think I can get by and I'm not prepared. And so I don't have the resources to take this test. How many times does that happen? Well, it happens to all of us because we all kind of low prepare for things, not just tests, but a lot of different things in life. And so we need to examine ourselves kind of from the perspective of there is definitely going to be stress in our life. When we know that stress is coming, it's how do we prepare for it? Stressors are any event where the body simply tries to adapt. And so what you're doing as you're walking down that hall is you're thinking, okay, listen, I didn't prepare for this test like I should have. Maybe I need to be prepared for either an inferior grade or maybe I can really pull together what I needed because I paid really good attention in class, right? Well, let's divide this up. There are more than one type of stress. You know, we kind of see the classroom example that I'm giving as a negative thing. Um, and that definitely is a negative thing. And what we would do is we would refer to that as a distressful event. And what you see down below is the term distress, meaning a negative response that are perceived, uh, that are perceived as negative and can definitely diminish your wellness. But there are also positive stresses out there. You know, if you were to sit down in a classroom where you weren't taking a test and perhaps you were seated next to someone that you kind of took an interest to, uh, maybe a little more than just social interest. Uh, maybe there was a little bit of a romantic interest there and that person actually has a conversation with you. Well, you are, you are going to definitely want to do your best to impress that person. And so there is a certain level of stress there. Now, is that a negative? thing? Well, hopefully not. Maybe it's really kind of should be considered as a positive thing because of the interaction and the relationship you're trying to make there. And so we have a term for that too. That's just simply called eustress. Eustress is a positive response that, is, that assists with personal growth, which is one of the key things that this whole class is trying to do for you is to give you personal growth. Now, one other thing that we need to say about stress is this. It is the only thing that we talk about in the first part of this class that is definitely a negative thing about our body. It is also a problem about our health, but it is not a disease state. And I want to say that again. Stress is not a disease state. It is, however, a state of the brain that can be altered. And the brain definitely does change. And we're going to look at that more in depth here in just a moment. So that being said, we have two classifications of stress, but then we actually subdivide that even further and say that stress can be very acute, meaning that it's very temporary. It doesn't last very long. And it also can be very chronic, meaning it persists for possibly hours, uh, maybe weeks, maybe months. And if it does, then it becomes very deadly to us. And we'll look at that as we travel through this module as well. So there's some contrasting events that happen here. Now, when we say contrasting, we're going back to those characteristics of positive and negative. And here's some examples that I just chose to list for you. Number one, marriage is typically thought of, thought of as a good thing. It's a eustress, a very positive thing. 
However, divorce is a very negative thing. In fact, it's the number two greatest stressor um, listed in many resources as the top 10 stresses. A new baby is many times thought of as a you stress a good thing you know we all kind of get happy and excited and, and unless that baby maybe was unplanned um, and maybe you don't feel like you're prepared for it which you know what I've got four of them and I didn't feel like I was prepared for any of them and I planned all of them so it's definitely stressful in a negative sense too but in the end I've never had one pop out and be handed to me that I didn't feel completely euphoric about a loss of a family member is the number one rated stressor and distress event that is listed among the top 10. A new job and a promotion is typically thought of as a good thing, although it does bring along some very difficult tasks usually, but overall we think of that as a positive thing. A distressful event that looks like that is when you lose your job. Um, again, that's in the top five as well. A great workout for me is very eustressful. Definitely difficult to get going, but once I kind of get that flywheel moving and it's kind of, you know, working on its own and I kind of been out there for a little bit doing it, I'm always glad that I did. There have only been a handful of workouts where I think, gosh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Um, and the circumstances around that are typically that I just wasn't prepared um, nutritionally or sleep wise, or maybe I just did something that caused injury. And so those are kind of the things that, that come along and say, listen, that's distressful. A eustressful event about money is making more money than you spend, because that means that you have money left over at the end of the month, right? And that's a very big thing. We've talked about money in the financial literacy video, and it's one of America's top rated stressors. Um, one of the things that people say they stress the most about. Debt, though, is very distressful. In fact, you've never made a payment on a debt and probably enjoyed it unless it was your last payment on that debt and that debt was then forgiven and paid off. That is absolutely one that you would say, man, what a great debt payment I just made because it's gone. Close relationships with positively driven people is a eustressful event because you want to make good things happen in relationships. We talked about that in the relational health side of things, but now we look at close relationships with negatively driven people and how that can be toxic and really take you down. We understand that those kind of people are not healthy in our life, and I'm going to urge you to consider removing those people, cleaving them from your entire perception of where you're going because they typically don't do you well. Um, now, there's obviously those times where you need to be there because you're their hope, uh, but that's kind of a different story and definitely not in the scope of this class to talk about. So what is stressing America? A survey said that stress is definitely up. No big surprise. Money, work, the economy, all big stressors. The thing that kind of drug me in on this particular survey was uh, that children are stressed. And what they found were that children who are obese and overweight are the most stressed. What they could not identify in the survey was, was it the stress that caused the obesity or was it the obesity that caused the stress? And I would tell you it's the chicken or the egg, which one came first? We don't know. What we know is when they make correlations like that where things are going up at the same time, they also go down at the same time. And so that's a very unique position to say, listen, we cannot always control the stress. We can control the weight. Let's control the weight and see if the stress comes down. And what an awesome way to do that. We're going to talk more about childhood BC in a few modules from now. Self-care is no longer a priority for most Americans. 54% say, I know I need to be physically active, but only 27% are saying I'm physically active enough. 40% will say I've intentionally wrecked my diet when I'm stressed. 40% will say I have laid awake at night and, and not been able to sleep because of stress. And I say that with a lot of passion because I am literally on the heels of waking up at two o'clock in the morning and being up since then because of some stress and some things that were on my mind, mainly making this video for you, right? No, it's absolutely good. Number four is lack of willpower. Willpower is a unique thing because in the study or in the survey, what they were looking at is, do you have the willpower to exercise? Do you have the willpower to 
get better nutrition? And then do you have the willpower to set some disciplines or some habits up to protect your sleep? And so what we're asking you to do is to consider these three things for your physical health, but also look at how they have definitely blended in to some other aspects of our health. And so as we talk about stress, we know that these three things are definitely going to come back up. Now, the question that I want to leave this slide is this, what does it take to have willpower? Well, let's go back to um, the last module, the very end, we talked about SMART goals. And with SMART goals, we said, not everybody always achieves their goals. What can you do then? Well, the question answered is this, you need to be actionable. You have to start doing something you may not be able to do all of that goal but if you put forth some effort at least you're in the fight now and actively in the fight means you're actively addressing the problem and that's where we're going to recommend again that shrink the change that is what we do to improve our stress levels so the stress response. This is kind of a unique thing that a guy named Sell said in like the 1800s. And he was the first one to kind of come in and say, hey, look, there's this situation going on um, where people are kind of getting, he didn't use the word stress, but he definitely said anxious and, and possibly, you know, their behavior is just not really good. And so what is that? And so this guy came along and he said, there's, there's some adaptation that's going on or, or, or rather some responses that are going on. He named it the general adaptation response. And to kind of give you some background into this, we all start in a very parasympathetic or homeostatic place. That's where we're all at at most times. But then a situation arises. And when that situation arises, we leave a parasympathetic state and we move to a sympathetic state, which is controlled through our autonomic nervous system in our brain. And the unique thing about that is it is the same whether it's a eustressful event or a distressful event. But what we also know is that there is a uh, basically a hierarchy that we will go through. And the number one stage in this general adaptation response is the alarm stage. This is your fight or flight stage. This is where cortisol is going crazy and it's giving you the ability to do that, just that, whether you want to leave the situation or whether you want to confront the situation, that's what you're doing. Now, if that situation were to, you know, basically be semi-resolved or resolved, there's still going to be some emotion and some physio physiological response going on. And that is where we get into the resistance stage. A good example of this is if you had a job and you walked into your job one day and your boss gives you the biggest chewing of your life, but it only lasts for three minutes. And after that three minutes, the acute stress, that temporary thing, or that very um, initial thing is gone. However, you're probably not just going to be over it after that three minutes is finished, are you? You're probably going to think about that for the rest of the day, maybe even. Maybe even the rest of the week. I don't know, probably into the weekend. It's definitely going to be with you. Well, this is that resistance stage. See, you've recovered, but you're still a little altered. And you know that because you're irritable you're frustrated, you have poor concentration. And many times we take that and we redirect our stress. Like our boss chews us out. So we go home and we chew our spouse out and then our spouse chews out our kids and then our kids beat the dog. Right. And so the cycle just continues. So we look at that and we understand that that is a very dangerous place to be because that is the precursor to chronic stress. Well, chronic stress really is a persistent stress. And then you look at stage three and you understand that exhaustion or the death stage comes in and this is where there's fatigue there's burnout there's depression there's anxiety and what's really unique is the brain literally has changes in it like thinning and thickening and weight loss and all these different things where we have a decreased stress tolerance and that is not very easy to deal with because now other things come in and we don't handle them as well right so that is why this is so important to understand what can i do about stress 
I've made my case and I hope that you've kind of put together some scenarios that you've dealt with where you've seen a very similar situation occur. Now, the physiology of stress is really unique. Again, a eustress or a distress. You're going to get the same framework out of your brain. Cortisol is definitely going to be there, the stress hormone. And when it does, it's going to excite some other aspects of our body. Number one, your pupils. They're going to get a little bit smaller. I'm sorry, they're going to get um, a little bit bigger because when we enter that sympathetic state and we get a little excited and we get stressed, they need to be able to see more. And then your hearing is going to also increase. You're going to decrease how much salivation you're going to make because you need to reserve that for the hydration of your body just in case you decide to fight. Another thing is this. Your heart rate is going to go up. Take a look at this right here. You're going to inhibit your digestive activity. You don't need to worry about digesting the food that you ate if you're in the middle of a fight or a run away from a dangerous activity. Um, it's also going to relax the bladder. And that just simply means you're not going to be thinking about if I need to go to the bathroom or not. And so we see those occurring. We also see some unique things like headache and heartburn, some rapid breathing pounding heart, a chronic problem long-term for men and women are fertility problems. We also see that with erectile dysfunction and missed periods, tense muscles, a stomach ache that occurs for a lot of reasons, mainly because the body doesn't digest food as well anymore. They get chronically high blood pressure. Even their blood sugar goes up. And I'm not really prepared to talk about all of this right now, but what happens is the liver literally releases a lot of glycogen to deal with the energy needs that you might need in a fight or a flight situation. But that becomes chronic and it's happening all the time. And when it happens all the time and your blood sugar is going up, well, then you're looking at a condition called type 2 diabetes, which we'll talk about very soon. Your immune is very weakened. You don't sleep well because of insomnia and then depression comes up. So these are the chronic effects. Now again, those are some things we see kind of on the outside. What's happening on the inside? Well, number one, we know cardiovascular disease, America's number one killer, is increased mainly because of plaque and this thing called vasoconstriction, meaning your blood vessels kind of try to tighten up and get smaller. And all of that kind of leads to something called a heart attack. And we'll kind of look more into CVD in the next module. But for a, a myriad of things to happen just because of stress, cardiovascular disease is the number one thing. Muscular system also is involved. Your muscles, you all know this, you get stressed, you get tight, you kind of hold your shoulders up, your posture really just suffers from it. Your immune system is definitely going to take a toll. You're going to get sick more often. You're not going to be able to fight off those nasty little bugs that your kids bring home because you're dealing with this stress. And so your immune system is not working the same as it should. Your digestive system, again, extra glucose from the liver, but you also get a big bunch of stomach acid that's not dealt with properly and so it starts to come back up and reflux. Other physical effects that you might experience are weight loss, weight gain, hair loss, skin problems like acne. You can develop a diabetes during this time. That happens because of the increase in glucose. You can have more digestive problems. You can lose your sex drive and libido. And then finally, stress and the mind. Listen, you can aggravate or cause an onset of mental disease like anxiety and depression just simply by experiencing chronic stress. So all of these things definitely have to be exhibited as a possible reason to deal with our stress. What are our sources of stress? Listen, if you make a big change like you're moving or you're changing jobs or changing schools or just transitioning from one significant other to a single life, then that's a big deal. Another thing is your performance. If you don't perform well, it definitely stresses you out. You may have relationship issues where there's conflict involved. Uh, and that's where you see right here at the bottom. You may miss up on some goals. And we've talked about that. What do you do? Well, you just have to remember that action is what counts. Even if you don't meet the goal, you still see it up there. You know it's there. And did you put any action towards it? Grade yourself off of that. Also, your environment can definitely be a factor in. And we talked about that at the top of the module where we talked about how willpower or is it that you're at the mercy of your environment. And listen, you may have a lack of willpower, but that's something you control. You may be in a bad place 
Think back to the girl who was getting beat up by her boyfriend. She's he's stealing all her money and he makes her do drugs. That's her environment. She can control it. In most cases, she can get out of it. I'm not saying that happens every time. So please don't misconstrue what I'm trying to say there. But she controls the situation. She needs to get out of it. Burnout is another one. Every one of us has probably experienced burnout at this age. And that's what's crazy is, is I'm talking to traditional college students who are 18 to 20. And I know that you've probably experienced some burnout in your time. So some quick shrink the change strategies number one what is your internal resource that gives you the ability to change in other words what's our psychological hardiness what has been occurring in our past that makes us better for the future we can rely on past experiences to say i got through this i can get through that number two exercise fun and recreation really decrease our stress. And I will tell you that, yes, exercise is a stress for me, but it is my stress reliever. And I use that as my number one stress reliever. I focus in on it. I protect the time. I get it done. And that is what makes me a better person. Um, you can ask my wife for the evidence on that. She knows when I don't do a workout that I'm going to be a little edgy. And she just says, listen, you need to go out and take a walk. And sometimes that's all it takes is just enough blood flow to kind of help me clear my head. Basic wellness measures. though, these are things that you just need to do to help remove stress from your life. Number one is you do need to focus on your nutrition. There are foods out there that are definitely going to affect your stress levels and they're going to affect them negatively. And if you eat a bad meal and you know it was a bad meal, you're going to have guilt over that bad meal. Then you're going to feel bad over that bad meal. Then why eat the bad meal in the first place? Let's talk about some strategies on how to change that physical activity. We're going to look at all of the data on there that says, hey, listen, this thing changes our ability to perceive things as negative or positive and it helps us to handle them. Some of my best ideas come when I'm out on a run, I'm listening to no music, no podcasts, just the sounds of nature and I'm in my own head and I solve problems. Another thing is protect your sleep. If you get that eight hours of sleep, your chances of having stress are very low and we'll show you that data very soon. Avoid alcohol and tobacco and that seems very counterintuitive in a culture that we're in that says if you're stressed have a drink, if you're stressed have a cigarette. These are not things that have been identified by any investigation to date as saying they help stress. In fact what they say is they make it worse. Uh, financial and time management is crucial. Um, and this is very easy to say, especially in 20 seconds on my video here, but you need to think about possibly if finances and time are an issue for you is downshifting, meaning that your expectations are going to move closer to reality. And that's probably going to save you a lot of frustration, but you have to develop some really uh, acute awareness as to your zeal for certain things. Um, maybe you have too much of a desire to buy, buy, buy or spend, spend, spend. And so you need to back that up. Maybe your time is too focused at work and not enough with building relationships. And so you over schedule things and that happens a lot with me. I just overcommit. I've kind of told you about that before. Thought and emotional management, negative thoughts and anger equal anxiety and depression. And so we have to really move those negative thoughts out. That's not very easy. I can tell you from experience that developing emotional intentional distribution is a very difficult task, but it's something that can be done. Revisit our first video to see some ideas on what I do for that exact thing. Seeking social support. This is where I'm going to my community group. I'm going to coaching. I'm finding people who will connect to me, right? It's not that it's just my home life, my work life, but maybe some other people who I need in my life to bring forth what it is that's best out of me. Relaxation techniques. Um, there are lots of them out there. This could be prayer. This could be yoga. This could be meditation. This could be Tai Chi. Oh my goodness. All the things out there that you could practice daily very quickly to help you relax. And then finally, spiritual practices such as prayer and meditation are very well found to improve stress habits. In fact, one of the things that I would say is this, if you think that prayer or meditation, um, or perhaps worship weekly, 
um, is good for 60 minutes and then um, not doing it again for another six days is a great way. Well, if you did that 10 minutes a day across seven days, look at how awesome you would get because you would get more of it more frequently. And anytime you increase the frequency on stuff like this, you're going to see a better carryover because then you're doing it daily. My next and final slide for this is to say, now, go take a look at the assignments. The assignments are very specific. I've given you two quick SWOT analysis to do, and I've also included a video over how to do that. Watch that video and then do the assignment, but make sure you consider all of those things ahead of time. See you later.